Okay, good morning. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this day. Um, we're thankful for the life that you've given us here on earth and the joy that we can experience as we get to know you. And even though we live in a world that is very dark, we know, Lord, that you give us light and hope and peace um, that the world cannot experience. We just ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and to continue to teach us as we study together. Bless each person, your angels. Watch over each one of us. And may we draw closer to you each day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are, we're going to be drawing out these reform lines, this reform line of um, Parminder. And um, so when we deal with this reform line, so when we have a reform line, what's the, what's the features of a reform line? What is it that we first look for? Probably events. Events. Okay, events, but what event specifically? We're going to draw out a reform line. What do we need to draw a reform line first? Period of darkness. We need a period of darkness, right? So um, uh, we can't just, you know, look at some events and decide that we have a reform line because we, need, we might know that those are way marks because of their characteristics, but we may not know what way mark they are, or at least they could be way marks in various different reform lines. But in order to have a reform line, you need a period of darkness because some darkness has come and that's why you need a reform line. Now, um, if we're dealing with a period of darkness in the context here of the judges, what, what kind of period of darkness are we looking at or are we looking for when it comes to Parminder? And, and this one's going to be a weird kind of reform line, as you, as you see. It's going to be um, kind of odd, but I'll, I'll explain what I mean once, once we start drawing it. Because when we're looking at this reform line, so... We're looking at a reform line of Parminder, not necessarily the reform line against Parminder. So the question is, can Parminder have a personal reform line? That that's that's sort of the what I'm I'm looking at here. Because we know that we can zoom into a reform line and we can see um, that there is um, you know, a way mark can have a reform line and that reform lines can refer to individuals. Jeff has a reform line, um, Moses, etc. But the question is, can we give a reform line to Parminder himself? And, and, and if we did, because Parminder is a false prophet, can we do that for a false prophet? Can a po false prophet have a reform line? Failed reform line. Well, not a failed reform line, a false reform line. Can we have counterfeit reform lines? I guess is what I'm saying. I haven't thought of it before. Okay. Well, we did with, um, and, and I've seen them many, many times, but, uh, you know, I guess probably the first example of this would be, uh, or maybe it's not the first in the Bible, but it's the, the one that I think I understood first. And that would be with the papacy. Uh, do we have a time prophecy, two time prophecies, that point to the beginning of the papacy rising to power in 538? That is, is it a reform line is there a period of darkness and two time prophecies 
that uh, precede 538 AD? I believe there are. Okay. Right, so so we could write out the papacy as a reform line, and we also have a counterfeit reform line dealing with their the papal false prophecy, um, you know, in various different ways actually. So, so when I was thinking about this, and I, and I'm not sure that uh, you know how to address it uh, completely, but Parminder has a time prophecy attached to 2014. So remember, we put Par Parminder as uh, being from 2014 basically to 2023 is sort of the the suggestion do we have two time prophecies that end in 2014 again i believe there are right so, so there are. So 2014, we could mark as a time of the end because we have the characteristics. And these are the these predictions. So remember in 2012, Parminder had um, taken the 126 shekels and he had counted them from 1888 and they came to 2014. And he had used that that number because we had already had 126 shekels representing the 126 years from 1863 to 1989. And then he also recognized that you could count the shekels um, by there being not just 50 to a manna, but 60. And if you counted 60 to a manna, you could count from 1863 to 2014, 151 uh, shekels. So, so he has two periods, 151 and 126, ending in 2014. So now he's part of that. Uh, I mean, Jeff is the one who first presented the 126 shekels. I'm not sure if he discovered it or if somebody else did and Jeff just used it. But that, that 126 shekels is something that's established as representing years. And then Parminder used that, and he made a prediction for 2014. Now, we're, we're going we're gonna to draw that here in a minute. But um, I want to look at this, this passage again here in Judges. So I always think that, you know, when we're studying, we should look at some scriptures and try to, to understand them, even though we've been looking at these. Um, and for some reason, I'm on Judges chapter 5. Let's go to Judges chapter 4. That's where I want to be. And, and we had talked about these symbols here. Um, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And, and that, that, that he, who mightily oppressed the children of Israel, is Sisera, the general of uh, who's the captain of the host of of Jabin, king of Canaan. And Deborah, the prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. So we have this Deborah, who's this judge, and we have this Sisera, who's this general. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So what is it that we have depicted here? What, what is this? If, if we take these symbols, because we've looked at the symbols, what is, what is being depicted here? Deborah is representing, we, we say, the message of the spirit of prophecy. What's, what's the situation? Um, symbolically in, in our history what is it symbolizing that there was a church in apostasy even with a, a prophet being among them 
Okay, right. So, so this describes the situation with the Adventist church. So Deborah being a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, and, and, and trying to understand who this Lapidoth is. It just means torches, but it comes from a word which means a, a bright and shining lamp or shining lamp, um, lamp or a flame, right? So this would represent the light that comes from the spirit of prophecy. Yeah, the feminine in plural too, or feminine in plural. Yeah, right. The o like. means feminine plural. Yeah. So it's a, it's a feminine form and it's a plural form. So, so exactly what this means, as far as we have Deborah, we're not saying Deborah is Ellen White. We're not saying, um, you know, the wife of Lapidoth is Ellen White. Um, you know, so Deborah's the wife of Lapidoth. We're not saying Lapidoth is Ellen White or Deborah's Ellen White or anything like that. But it has to do with a church that has a prophetess. That is, there's this message. And there's this, she's judging Israel at that time. And, and is this true of this period of time in which Parminder arises? His message arises. Yes. Okay. And we have the children of Israel, which is God's people, and, and they're being oppressed by Sisera. And um, we have this period of time, 20 years, which we can place from 2001 um, to 2021, right? So we're, we're just going to take these 20 years as symbolizing this. And there's other, other ways in which we look at it as well. Um, we looked at 20 months. So there's a period of time of 20 months that fits into that structure. I'm not going to go into those details now. Um, and then she dwells under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel. So I didn't have time uh, to look at exactly which city this was. I don't know if anybody looked at this, which city this would be, because there's four different places. Um, I would imagine that it's the if uh, Rama that is in Ephraim. Yeah, which is located in the hill country. So that's that's possible. Now, what about the one in Naphtali? Could it be that one? I think it would be too distant to compare it. Okay. Because you have Bethel and Ephraim. Why would you just say... No, I mean, there's so many other cities in between. You yeah. wouldn't go so far a distance. Okay, so it'd be the one next to Bethel. Okay, so and it's in Mount Ephraim. So, so that's the one we would take. Okay, and so she's between these two. And and can we say that Rama represents the state and Bethel, the church? Or is there some other way in which we should look at what? what it means she dwells between these two places. Because uh, I was looking at it as like a, the, the separation of church and state. Uh, so a message about the coming Sunday law. But maybe it means something else. Anybody have any uh, way that we can look at this? Well, you have like um, Rama being associated with like a high place. Yeah. Which okay. were generally, generally places of idols and false worship. Okay. So, so still, yeah. So, so the connection with the state is followed. Okay. So, so maybe that even makes more sense. I mean, you have church, the true church, Bethel, the house of God, and false worship. And that that this message stands between those two, because it, to me, between 
refers to kind of a separation of these things. Although you have, um, I think this is the Rama which uh, Samuel lived and yeah. had a school of the prophets. Okay, so. So I don't know if I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not definitely settled on anything. I'm just throwing ideas here. So if it's if it's the school of the prophets, what would that could we apply that one? If this is going to happen at the end of the judges. You know, this is quite. Yeah, I know, but just as a symbol, if it's the city where the school of the prophets is going to be, could we uh, attach it to that symbol? And then, and then we have this under a palm tree. What would be the significance there? Because this means um, uh, to be erect a palm tree. Tamar is the word. Is that connected to Tamar? Uh, I believe so. Um, but it occurs, actually, it says here in Jeremiah 10, 5. Uh, they are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. So this here refers to uh, these idols right, that are upright as the palm tree. So it's kind of odd that the, the King James Concordance only gives us the reference in Jeremiah, even though this word is also in Judges 4 verse 5. So I'm not sure why that is. Now, as a, as a question, we're looking at this as the symbol of the palm trees, right? Yeah. Aren't palm trees normally found in the desert where there is water? Yeah. And doesn't waters in scripture normally denote peoples? Yeah. So... If we're looking at this, I mean, aren't it wouldn't Deborah and her husband be dwelling where the people are obscured? I mean, the Savior made reference that sheep of other folds have I. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that this is that that Deborah is a representation of a prophet that is not well known to other people? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I could do those types of connections there. Um, I mean, one of the things is she dwells under the palm tree of Deborah, right? I mean, she is Deborah. She dwells under this palm tree of Deborah, which is probably named because of her, I would assume. Her name means a bee. Um, so they're just trying to tell you the location of where she lived, where she dwelt. Um, But I, I sort of think of this almost like marking a way mark more than anything, but. OK, 
Okay, so how about we look at this as, see, here was where, where my thinking was, is that this is representing the way mark of the Sunday law, of the spirit of prophecy. That is, we, we are in the time of the Sunday law. And spirit of prophecy is looking for this way mark called the Sunday law, correct? That's, right. the, next, that's the next way mark. And here we are, and we're underneath this way mark, this palm tree, which is a vertical marking on a line. Like that's that's the to me it's like the 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 plummet. And and this is the time in which we're living in, this time in which we would call the Sunday law. And that's going to begin at 9-11. And so at the time of 9-11, which Ellen White has marked, we have these symbols which would address the Sunday law. And and we're under this, this judgment that is the spirit of prophecy is what we go to uh, for judgment, right? We're... This Ellen White is the prophet of the end times, and she's really the prophet of the Sunday law. So that's kind of how I was looking at it. I don't know um, if other people can see it that way. But to me, we come to 9-11, which the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down and marks the Sunday law for this movement. Even though Ellen White with Revelation 18 is putting it at the Sunday law itself, but that's where I see that we're at. We're at that way mark. So this palm tree to me represents this way mark of the Sunday law. And that's why I was looking at Rama and Bethel as being these two, like church and state, though it could also work, you know, for the true and the false, the foolish and the wise virgins, those who have true worship and those that have false worship. I think and, that, that point's a better application. Okay. So so this is the time in which Parminder comes. What's that, uh, Angela? Yeah, my I just got back on Yahoo, so now I can get off the phone. But I was going to say regarding the palm tree, uh, well, in Psalm 92, 12, I think I put this in chat a few times, the righteous shall flourish as the palm tree. That's the first part of that verse. And also the palm tree, it reminds me of Jericho, the city right. of the palm trees. And then you have the seven times. Yeah, except this is really a different kind of word. I mean, I understand in English it's the same. Um, it was Psalm 92, what, um, 12? 12. Yeah. Yeah. So this, I mean, this is a related word. So the, the palm tree, tap Tamar, so that you're correct. That's the same, a similar word. Anyway, this is uh, 8560, uh, which is referring more to the trunk of the tree, that it's straight up. Um, so uh, I, I don't think we can ignore that. Um, and also we have Jericho, that's the city of palm trees. But I, I don't think that this would be referring to uh, the message of Jericho. I mean, maybe we could say in some ways um, the message of Islam is connected to this message. But, you know, Jericho isn't being marked here. Like when we have the city of palm trees being marked, which was Jericho. I mean, we know this isn't Jericho. This is... Uh, where Deborah lived between Ramah and Bethel. But we yeah, also but could, you take it in a, could you take it in a spiritual sense or call to recognize the powerful spiritual forces that we're fighting against and the forces on our side are so much more powerful. You know, like we're exposing the papacy, we're exposing sin, including sin in our own lives, I would hope. And we're conquering all that. Mm -hmm. the white like the white horse the man on the white horse going forward to conquer and to continue conquering okay um yeah so when i look at this when i say it's a waymark it's a waymark that marks righteousness so remember in isaiah 28 
precept upon precept, line upon line. And then we, we have this line in verse 17, judgment also will I lay unto the line. So do we have judgment here regarding Deborah? Yes. Okay. And righteousness to the plummet. The plummet is a way mark that, that is vertical. A line, a measuring line is horizontal. And, and so can we see that this would be the same symbolism here regarding Deborah? This is ref a reform line. The palm tree representing righteousness, which is a waymark. Waymarks are righteousness. Judgment is the line itself. Would that fit in what? And that's the cross. Thing? And that's the cross. Yes, right, where the two intersect. Mm -hmm. that makes sense okay so so that's how i would look at this story here regarding uh deborah and the message that it has that this is the time of a way mark specifically the way mark that ellen white is pointing to the sunday law which begins at 9 11. but so in that time of this reform line we're going to have another reform line that is we're going to be zooming into a reform line that this movement has understood um but we're going to be seeing a reform line that is parminder's reform line that is it's a counterfeit reform line and it doesn't mean that because it's a counterfeit reform line that everything about that how he builds this reform line is is false for instance the the papacy has a counterfeit reform line, but 538 is a way mark. 508 is a way mark. 1798 is a way mark. But those are parts of a way mark of a counterfeit reform line, but they're still part of the structure of prophetic chronology. That is, they're not, they're not false way marks. It's just that the person who's marking them, or the, the church that's marking them in the case of the, the Catholic Church, is is giving a false message in which way do you associate the papacy and reforming well because it's responding to the darkness of paganism right it's it's providing an answer to paganism but it is really just paganism dressed up in christian garb so it's it's a fake reform line in that sense it's a counterfeit of the true but it is in response to paganism, right? Which is darkness. So you got these two time prophecies from the 30 years and the 1260 years. And, and you could probably even put the 504 years in there. Um, ending in 538, where the papacy then arises. That's in a sense, it's time of the end. And it seeks to reform, in quotation marks, uh paganism but it just ends up becoming paganism so the papacy does not is not a reform line of god it's a counterfeit it's a satanic reform line does that make sense that helps okay um and and tess dealt with the counterfeit reform line which i think was valid dealing with the papacy uh, and its um, connection with uh, um, the, the, the Fatima prophecy, right? So this was a counterfeit of, of our reform line, of the repeat of history, so to speak. So just like you had the, the reform line of the papacy, you know, 538, etc., cetera, you have this, this counterfeit reform line, which is its repeat of history. Um, and, and so you have that also, um, so that you can look at these two counterfeit reform lines, but they're counterfeit in response to the truth. The first time I've actually seen a counterfeit reform line was back in 2010. I think it was the, either the second last presentation of Jeff's or the last presentation in Oklahoma. And he was showing a counterfeit reform line, uh, dealing with, um, 
the papacy and the 9-11 and everything. I, I don't remember the form line in detail. I just remember that there was, uh, uh, that it was dealing with the counterfeit. So it was a satanic reform line. I'd, I'd have to go back and watch that video again uh, to remember all the details of it. Because I didn't understand much about the message at the time. I just noticed that there was someone in the audience who noticed something and Jeff wrote it on the board. It was something he hadn't noticed. And he just mentioned, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the sprinkling of the latter rain. Um, you know, that God is giving us light. So, and I was impressed by that because you don't, you don't see a lot of preachers who are just going to take something from the congregation um, and just incorporate it into what they're preaching. Usually they're going to be a bit more uh, skeptical of things that other people are doing. They want to have the glory, so to speak. And, and Jeff wasn't like that. So that was something that impressed me. But, but anyway, we know that we can have counterfeit reform lines, that Satan can counterfeit the true. And if we look at Parminder's message, uh, I'm going to start drawing this out now and see what we can do with it, if we can, if it's going to make sense. And Okay, so <clears throat> let's just draw a reform line. So we're going to have a period of darkness. And we're going to have to decide what that is. So you're going to have darkness here. And then you're going to have a time at the end. Now, we have two time prophecies that, that are going to end. And we're going to say that the time of the end is 2014. So 2014, Parminder is going to look at as being the Sunday law. Right? That is, he's predicting the Sunday law on Ellen White's big line. But we know that this is not the Sunday law. Um, but I'm going to say this is the time of the end. So if it's the time of the end, we're going to have uh, two different things. We're going to have the 126 from 1888, and we're going to have the 151 from 1863. Now, what then, what then happens here that marks the time of the end? And what is this reform line about? If there is a darkness, now I'm saying this darkness, because remember, this is a false reform line, doesn't necessarily mean the darkness is uh, not true darkness. Because paganism, for instance, is darkness, and but papalism is also darkness. But there's going to be some kind of light that's going to come to this movement that's going to respond to some kind of darkness. And Parminder is going to be the reformer, right? So this is going to be Parminder. So what could be the darkness that Parminder is responding to, if you think about his, his message, especially related to 2014? Well, he got to he got to the point where you said there's no Sunday law. Okay, yeah, but I don't know if we could put that as his message. That's going to be something later on. Yeah, I think so. So, so part of what Parminder is trying to do, he's trying to introduce time prophecies, right? So the darkness can here can be no time prophecies. Okay, does that make sense? A good that seems to, seems to. Okay, so he's gonna, and this is just a suggestion. I'm just 
trying to understand this. Okay. <laughs> so, so now we're going to have 2014. Now, 2014 is then going to mark some events that are going to lead to um, Parminder's initial time prophecy being accepted. Now, I would say that the time when this is accepted, that there's going to be this increase of light, right, regarding time prophecies. And then you're going to have 2017. And in 2017, what happens? For Parminder's reform line. Because we have a lot of things happening in 2017. So do we have an organization? And if we have organization, what kind of waymark is this? Would we put this as formalization? Or is this an empowerment? I mean, we could even put 2016 when Parminder is ordained. So we could put here, so what is it? Wouldn't January 27th, 2016. Wouldn't 2016 be empowerment then? No, that would be formalization. Oh, so. It goes February. It's February 27th? Yeah, I think okay. so. Yeah, I was February 27th, yes. And, and so maybe this is the formalization of the message, like when William Miller is ordained. Right, that's what I'm saying. Okay. And then this would be the empowerment. Right? Didn't I say the opposite? Yeah, you said the opposite. So we got a formalization. So I guess I could just put... First angel arise, first angels formalized, first angels empowered. And then we're going to have uh, other waymarks. We're going to have the arrival of the second angel. Uh, the second angel is going to be formalized. And then the second angel is empowered. And then we have the arrival of the third angel. Okay. Right? So that's how we would have a reform line. So we'll just do this. Now, so we can definitely line this up with, with the formalization in 1883, 1833, pardon me, um, with William Miller getting his credentials. He's ordained. So Parminder's ordained. And then we're going to have uh, 2017, we're going to have this empowerment of the message with uh, the organization of this movement. That's going to begin in 2017. So if you're going to have the second angel empowered, wouldn't this be 2018? And, and this would be Italy. And this would be Italy. And do we have 9-11 here and 9-11 here? Okay, now I need to be clear. Yeah. You're, writing, you're writing the 2018 above second angel arrival. And you said oh, yeah, that's what I, meant. I meant arrival. Yes, I meant it arrived. It's not empowered. OK. All right. Lives. OK, then then, yes, I can I can see what you're saying here. OK, and remember the 9-11 prayers here and here. OK, agreed. And remember how we take our reform line and we put 9-11 as the second angel arrives and 9-11 as the first angel em empowered. Right. Right. Okay. So so this so far seems pretty good, right? I mean, it just falls into place. Now, this first time I've actually thought through this, I just thought about this very sketchingly as I woke up this morning. But you can see it falls into place really well. 
correct? Anybody have any problems with this question? So far, so far it's got a good structure behind it. Okay. And then we have to have these way marks here are going to be midnight and the midnight cry. Right? Because that's what, that's how we would look at a reform. April 19th, you know, this would be the first day of the first month, fifth day of the fourth month, first day of the fifth month, 10th day of the seventh month. So we have to look at the a formalization of this message and an empowerment of this message. Now, there's different ways we could look at it, but the way that I would look at it is this is October 3rd, and this is October 13th, and this is November 9th, so 2019. And this is just Parminder's personal reform line of, of the message of time setting. Tess is going to present the formalization of this message when she gives this date, 10 days later. So she does two presentations. And those two presentations are called the midnight cry and 10 years, 10 days later, the midnight cry is given. And then we have this, which is empowering this message of time setting that's pointing to November 9th. Any criticisms of this suggestions? Because we already marked this as the midnight cry back in 2018. And this was based upon these two camp meetings as well, right? So, and especially here, remember we have here June 9th, and here we have June 2nd. And from this June 9th, we have this 126 days. And then, of course, we have the 391.5 here. And we can see that October 13th was definitely an empowerment of this message of time setting that Parminder had started so far back here. Now, maybe this is, now, when we look at this, I said it's a counterfeit reform line, but it's based upon true waymarks, right? Just as we would have with, uh, any reform line. These waymarks are valid waymarks, but this message of November 9th is a false message. Doesn't mean November 9th is not a true waymark or October 13th isn't a true waymark. These are, but this is zooming into something which is a part of our message. And, and this is the way Mark, this is the reform line that we can connect to Parminder's message of time setting. Because Parminder is going to be setting time. And it's going to be using this prediction. I mean, in a sense, you could say he's a proclaiming prophet and a gathering prophet if you wanted to, right? Because he's going to be one proclaiming this uh, 2014. But it's going to be the time of the end. And he's going to be there. And he's going to go through this reform line. And, and it's not till just before November 9th that this movement rejects um, Parminder's message. Right? It's not going to be till really September 7th, 63 days before. I mean, to me, I don't see how we could just dismiss this. At least as a reform line, drawing it out. A any comments? I know I always present these things and then ask for comments, and you have to think about them. But does it make sense? Is it something we already know? Seems, just seems, to, li seems to line up at this point. Okay. And definitely, if we were 
uh, if I had drawn this out um, back in 2018 or even in early 2019, we and, and, and Jeff did draw something similar to this. So, um, so it's not a new line. He did drew something similar. Uh, to this back in 2019, uh, and I think even in 2018, he under because he understood this end of the time these time periods, but you know he wasn't putting in you know the Italy's as the two 911s and etc. Here I got to switch my camera, switch my microphone. Okay. <laughs> So, so what would this be telling us? If we draw this reform line like this, um, what, what, it, what are we zooming in onto? What, what way mark in Millerite history is this paralleling? What reform line in Millerite history? I know you guys are thinking about it still. Wouldn't uh, it be trying to reproduce August 11 because it's at the end of the 391.5? OK. Um, so, so the question is, we have August 11th, 1840. And is this in some way parallel to Josiah Litch's prediction? That, that's the question. And, and, and that's because we have the 391.5. Now, we also can at attach that to Ezekiel. which would be leading to the siege of um, Samaria? Uh, the siege of Jerusalem. Okay. Right. Okay. So, because it, it should be paralleling something in Millerite history, because that's what we're doing. We're paralleling Millerite history. Now, when we look at Millerite history, I don't know, I don't think I could put this with Josiah Litch's prophecy in that it, it comes too late. Because Josiah Litch's prophecy marks 9-11 in, in that context. So it comes after that. So this is after 9-11, and, and, and we had asked the question yesterday dealing with 9-11 because we have two different 9-11s in our history. We have the 9-11 that parallels August 11th, 1840, and the 9-11 that parallels the first day of the first month. Now, Samuel Snow has a reform line, and, and he has a reform line of his letters. And then he also has a reform line in which um, uh, he's, he's going to give midnight in the midnight cry. And so we say that Samuel Snow is typified by Ezekiel. And both Ezekiel and Snow typify this movement. Now, what we, what we would have done in the past, you know, prior to... Uh, you know, November 9th, prior to, like, if we were back in 2018 and we had drawn this, we would just see this as a reform line that is Samuel Snow's reform line. Now, in Millerite history, 
we do have different um, messages that are going to have failed predictions. So what are they? How many failed predictions are there in Millerite history? Because we often think of the two, the end of, of Miller's prediction, the end of Snow's prediction. But is there other disappointments or other ends of predictions that fail? Okay, when's their first disappointment? When is the first time the Millerites are disappointed? It's not April 19th, 1844. They have March 21st. March 21st. 1844. Okay, what about January 1st? What about the 10th day of the seventh month in 1843? Are, are these also disappointment? Yes. Okay, they are, right? Now, they're not disappointments to the point that, you know, <laughs> Miller needs to write a retraction or, or an apology and a defense or anything. But they, they're going to start looking at dates. Now, after they make the charts in 1842, um, they start to try to refine when that Jewish year 1843 ends. Okay, so Angela says, perhaps Snow's forged letter about the arrest of Christ could be Parminder's teaching. Okay, so this, this is a very good point that she's bringing up, which we'll look at. So, so we know there's other disappointments, right? There's, and Snow is involved in uh, the one that happens in the fall of 1843. So anyway, going back, we know that they're trying to refine that, that time. Now, so about the year 1843, some people expect that Christ might come back. Um, in 1842, they're looking to maybe Christ is going to come back in 1843, like January 1st. Because at first, they're, they're not, um, they're, they're not um, using a biblical calendar at all. They're just using our calendar, right? That's how they're, they're looking at this. They're, they're not thinking about there's a biblical calendar. When they think about the year 1843, it's from January 1st to December 31st. Now, Miller, in December of 1842, so remember, they introduced the chart in 1842, but it's not until December of 1842 that Miller is going to define the year 1843. And then he's going to define it from March 21st, 1843 to March 21st, 1844. So that's going to be, you know, three months. Uh, away from March 21st. So, and he's doing this because, you know, people are going to expect that Jesus is going to come back in 1843, anytime in 1843. But Miller defines, no, that it's not going to begin until March 21st, the year 1843, because it's going to be the Jewish year. So when you look on the charts and you see the year 1843, how would you define that when they made the chart? When does 1843 begin and end according to the 1843 charts, which is made in May of 1842? January 1st. January 1st, 1843 to January or December 31st, 1843, right? And so, and that's one of the arguments I have that the 538 on the chart BC is defined also from January 1st to December 31st. That is, when they made the charts, they weren't thinking spring to spring and fall to fall years. That hadn't that concept hadn't really 
come into the movement yet. So, so we know that the year 1843 actually later was defined as spring to spring. Okay, so, so now you have these disappointments. So the first disappointment could maybe be March 1843. That is, some people might expect that Jesus is going to come back at the beginning of the Jewish year 1843. But remember, um, that didn't happen. And in May of 1843, Miller is going to write a letter, uh, I believe, to Josiah Litch. Um, no, not Josiah Litch. To um, the other guy. Uh, Himes. Hi, J Joshua Himes. Um, and I think it's also addressed to both of them, but to Himes and Litch, I think. I think it's both of them. But he's going to suggest that Jesus is going to come back in connection with the fall types. So he makes this argument. Now, Samuel Snow knows of this and is expecting that Christ is going to come back in the fall. But when Christ doesn't come back, he reevaluates this and recognizes that Miller was correct about the fall, but it's not going to be in 1843, because that's past. It's going to be in 1844. And he gives his personal testimony on December 31st, 1843, at the Boston Tabernacle. And the next day, on January 1st, he decides that he's going to uh, share his message that Christ is coming back in the fall of 1844, not in the spring of 1844, which Millerites are still going to hold on to, um, you know, until midnight and the midnight cry. So they're, they're, they're still looking that the end of Miller's prophecies are correct. So then you're going to have a disappointment for some people. That's March 21st, 1844. And for those people, they have not accepted the calendar. So maybe in some ways we can look at Parminder's reform line as somehow a zoom into um, these two Passovers, these two different ways of counting the year. Because we know that Parminder is not going to accept the light on chronology. So if we're going to make a parallel with Millerite history, it should be some kind of a reform line that's attached to a false message regarding time. Uh, I, I don't know necessarily if that's correct, you know, putting it as March 21st. But we have an April 19th, first day of the first month, but we also have a March 21st, first day of the first month. And could it be that Parminder has never accepted the correct time? that he's going to make a prediction based upon a rejection of light. So there are going to be people who are disappointed in Millerite history on March 21st, 1844. And those people are going to, it, it's not like you have, you know, the way we always present it is there's like 500,000 Millerites, and then on April 19th, there's 50,000. Actually, the vast majority of these Millerites, uh, once March 21st, 1844 has passed, have already rejected the message. That is, they were followers of Miller, and Miller never really um, understood the changing calendar. Sure, we had... Um, um, Joshua V. Himes and others writing about how to calculate the end of the year, but it seems that most Millerites just accepted March 21st. And so when that date had passed, they had already lost their faith in the Millerite movement. They weren't looking to April 19th. You only had some who were. Is there a problem with this parallel? Is anybody, I know you're thinking about it for the first time, so <clears throat> is there any problems with this suggestion? 
thought came to me that you're paralleling Parminder with Miller. Um, no, I'm par paralleling Parminder with those that follow the message of Miller. But but I see what you're saying. You know, it could be that um, it could be that uh, you know when we look at I mean I don't know of any particular person who was leading out in uh, establishing March 21st and that once that passed they gave up the message. Um, but I'm just saying that Parminder was attaching his message. Uh, to an understanding of time and rejecting further light so that the message that ended with that disappointment on March 21st, 1844, there, you, remember you're going to have these two classes, right? There's these two Passovers. And one of the things that I, I came to understand back when I understood uh, Samuel Snow's letters is that that's going to represent uh, two different groups. The ones who recognize, um, because you're going to have from 2014 to 2017, you're going to have these separation that begins in 2014 and culminates in 2017. And that's going to be the two Passovers. That's the way that I've understood it. Now, we're still going to keep going on. There's going to be another separation, but this is a different type of separation that happens in 2019. And what's the difference between what happened in 2014 and 2017, which are two major points where we mark a separation in this movement, and what happened in 2019? Because in 2014, what happened? Well, that was the path of the just separated it from Jeff. Yeah, so you're going to have people separating from the movement. That is, they're going to be leaving, right? Same in 2016, 2017, when you have uh, the Alabama group, you have um, um, Mark Bruce, and you have Dwayne Dewey, and you have um, Tanya, right? You have these people leaving the movement in 2017. So as, as the church is moving towards this organization, you have these people leaving the movement. So, it, and it's gonna happen over this period from 2016, e even into 2018, you have people leaving. So it doesn't happen all at once. You still have Dwayne Dewey and Tanya uh, into early 2018, but really they had already left in 2017. They just, we don't know about that until 2018. So, but these are people leaving the movement. But what happens in 2019 that's different? Doesn't the movement leave us? Yes. Okay. So we have the vast majority of the movement leaves. They become the movement in a sense, you know, we're sort of left out, right? So it's different. We didn't, we didn't, you know, push them out. They actually just pushed us out. And so we had this final group, so to speak, of, of what was left of FFA. Now, now, that movement then is going to give a message. And, 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 and you can see that the, the problem here is that you're going to have these separations of these groups. Now, one of the things about Millerite history is um, 
I mean, we sort of tend to have a very simplified view of what happened. That is, not every Adventist who was following Miller accepted Samuel Snow's message. Many of the people who had rejected Snow's message still ended up as Adventists, still ended up as Millerites. So when the Great Disappointment happened, there was people who were still holding on to Miller's message. When that message passed, they, they didn't want to have anything to do with that time setting. They didn't accept the light of the midnight cry. They looked at it as a false message. And they wanted to go on, and they formed what we call First Day Adventists. They never accepted any of the light, but they never accepted the, the midnight cry in the first place. Now, some, some of them did, but not everyone did. So, so it's, it's not as always clean, uh, clean cut or cut and dried as we think it is when it comes to how things unfolded, these different groups of people and how people saw things. And so when we look at our history, you could easily see how Parminder's movement, what we call the Omega, could look at this reform line and say, well, this is the true reform line, even though they don't accept some of this. So that's part of the problem is they don't accept October 13th and the 391.5. Neither did they accept the 2911s. So they couldn't even, even accept this line without accepting our message. But, but you could see how they could at least think that they're the true movement. But we can show that their movement fits into the light that they rejected. Does that make sense? And this is the way that the Adventists were able to, Seventh-day Adventists, because we could accept all of the light but in order for these other people to continue on, they had to reject light. That is, they had to deny the light behind them. Parminder's movement has to deny the light behind it because it also denied much of the light in front of it, much of the light as it came. But we have the ability to look at our history and see that this reform line, which Parminder is a part of, we might call it a time-setting reform line maybe, or the November 9th reform line, I don't know what to call it. But what we can do is we can say that there was this message, and, and this message, the conclusions that Parminder drew, were based upon false premises, a false system of study. But we can look at this and we can correct it. So it doesn't mean that this is all darkness, that these dates somehow have to be removed. In fact, Without understanding what we understand now, we couldn't even analyze what happened with Parminder's movement. Are people following what I'm saying? Because to me it's clear, but I don't know how clear it is to others. Like you've just, you, you pointed out several times, this is not only new to you, it's new to us as well. <laughs> okay. So this, this is something that when you're taking it in, yeah, it takes a little bit really to be able to consider what's being said. Now, is it logical? Yes, it is logical. Is mm -hmm. it, does it help us to understand some of what has happened before? Yes. Yeah, and, and see, we, we already understood. So I just put it back up here. So we already understood that there are these two time prophecies. Jeff has marked those out and marks them ending in 2014. Um, so he's already recognized this structure, right? The time of the end, because you have two time periods. And the, and the darkness would have to be the idea that we cannot have time attached to our message, right? That would be the darkness, no time prophecies. And so we come to 2014 and we're gonna have this increase of light that is, we, we start to recognize that 2014, the date Parminder had predicted, and I understood this in 2014, I noticed that 
that there was a type of a Sunday law that he was predicting within the movement because of the separation that occurred in 2014. So this was recognized, not just by me, but by, by others. Um, but Parminder, he ends up coming into this, this, staying in this movement in spite of the fact he makes this prediction. And I believe it's in 2016, he starts to argue that he was correct in his application of the 126 and the 151. And this is like in the end of 2016. Now, but in 2016, on February 27th, he's going to be ordained, right? So we can see how that lines up with the formalization of the message, just as it does with Miller's ordination in 1833. And then you're going to have this empowerment of the message in 2017, which is going to be this organization. Now, we can also see the satanic elements here. So in 2017, this is in September of 2017. Now, or, or pardon me. So you're going to have in, uh, in Italy in June, you're going to have this 9-11. Uh, but in September, you're going to have the organizational camp meeting. So, so we see that 2017 has lots of things attached to it. We have the Italy camp meeting and also the Romanian camp meeting, which is going to be in September. So, so Parminder has, um, uh, as far as the, the Italy camp meeting, I don't know if I can attach something about time setting to that, other than that we have this 9-11 prayer. But we're also going to have the organization that occurs in 2017. And then... We're going to have the same 9-11 prayer. So in Italy, it's going to be closing Pentecost, opening the Sabbath. In 2018, it's going to be closing the Sabbath. And so that's, that June 9th date becomes important. And, and we also know that the second angel arrives because that next day, June 10th, is going to be the introduction of time setting to this movement. So that the movement officially now is accepting time setting. Jeff accepts time setting. And then what we have is we have this prediction of uh, Daniel from Brazil that happens on July 27th, where he predicts it's going to be 126 days from the camp meeting in Italy to the midnight cry. But we know that we have this formalization of this message when Tess presents the date November 9th in these two presentations. And then we already recognize that the midnight cry occurred on October 13th, 10 days later. And then, of course, it proclaimed this November 9th. It confirmed this November 9th date. I can't personally see any problem with this. But the one thing we can say is, did anything that Parminder and Tess predicted about November 9th occur? I don't recall anything. Yeah, so everything they predicted didn't occur. Now, if you remember, so on October 13th, I recognized the 391.5. Uh, the next day I do a presentation called Some Calculations. And, and then Parminder offers to give me some time at the camp meeting of, over above what I already had. So I had two, two speaking um, slots. And he, I got two more because of Parminder hearing my message on October 14th. And so at the camp meeting I presented my original message dealing with the week of Christ. And then I presented... Um, my understanding of the 391.5 and it was actually on the sabbath that i came to understand the two 911 prayers i got an email from uh, <clears throat> can't think of his name uh, at the moment but i got an email talking about the one 911 prayer in 2000 
and a 17, but I didn't know about the one in 2018. And that was told me. So I actually did a presentation on the Sabbath as well. So I did uh, basically five presentations. The one on the Sabbath was just really short, about 15 minutes. Um, so that's going to be on October 20th. And in that presentation, though, those presentations that I did, I was quite clear in my understanding of November 9th that it was not the close of probation for the righteous. It was going to be a separation in the movement, and it was only a close of probation for the false priests, um, which wasn't really accepted. But um, that's a long story behind that. So when November 9th came, this movement had rejected November 9th as far as the events that were that were to be to occur, according to Tess. But we still recognized it as a waymark. And then from there, the, the understanding of July 18th is going to be a completely different reform line. So so this one comes up to uh, the three angels arriving. Now we could um, attach a formalization of the message after that and an empowerment of this third angel's message. If we wanted to, we could look at things in our history, but normally we just have a reform line end at the arrival of the third angel. Now, do people have problem with having a reform line of Parminder that marks these true way marks? So, Because some people might say, well, this is a validation of Parminder's message. I don't think it's a validation as much as it is <clears throat> following the pattern that we're seeing from the Millerite time frame. Right. And, and, and we already recognize these things. So, I mean, there's a little more detail here of things that we've uncovered since then that we can, we can apply, especially like the two 9-11s. I really like that because that fits in with what we've been understanding about the lines. But we already understood October 13th is the midnight cry. Well, that means we'd have to look at where midnight is. And, and we know at midnight is a proclamation of a time. So Boston and Exeter would line up with October 13th and October 3rd, or 3rd and 13th. So that'd be Boston and Exeter. But if we're going to, if we're going to understand that, we wouldn't take this as, we would just put this over top of that and say, you know, Parminder is Samuel Snow, right? Or Tess is Samuel Snow. Or, you know, me and Tess and Parminder and, and different people are all part of what happened with Samuel Snow's message. Because we know that this is just a zoom into a way mark on our reform line. And to me, this is a zoom into 2014. That is that way mark we call sunset. That is uh, the application of 9-11 being uh, the arrival of the second angel's message in 1844, April 19th. But what I'm doing is I'm attaching that April 19th date to um, the March 21st date. That is, we have two dates in Millerite history that are the first day of the first month. And so we can take that 2014 zoom in that we have here of Parminder and we can attach it to March 21st, 1844 as being the false first day of the first month, where April 19th is the true first day of the first month. And so it's the two different classes. Now, if we continue this line on, um, there's different ways in which we could look at it. But one of the things we can see is that the people who rejected July 18th after July 18th are still a part of this reform line. That is the people who follow this reform line, who take this as the true message, they're going to be the ones that fall away, right? 
because they're not going to accept July 18th, 2020. Even if they had accepted it for a while, they're going to reject it. So I think this will help us understand Judges 4 and 5 better as we continue to look at this history. So remember, when I, when I put, put these different uh, enemies or these different reforms, judges, you know, we had marked one at 9-11, right? That's going to be Othniel. And then we're going to have um, another one connected with the history of the 2520 to 2004, 2005. And then we're going to have uh, 2014. And that's going to be this one, Judges chapter 4, 4 and 5. And so 2014 is going to mark this history. So this reform line is just a zoom into the reform, the way mark of 2014. But this way mark is going to reach to 2019, or this reform line is going to reach to the next way mark of, that we have here. So this is different from Parminder. Remember how Parminder did reform lines. He did them as staggered. So he would just take the time of the end, moves over one way mark for the next reform line, and then the reform line after it, it moves over one way mark. And everything lines up after that, roughly. But we can see that that is only partially correct. That is, if we understand that we zoom into a way mark, to create a reform line. It gives us a much deeper understanding of, of how this relates to Millerite history. That is, we can see that in Millerite history. And so this should help us to, to sort through all of these reform lines that we're looking at here in the Book of Judges. That, in a sense, they're repeat and enlarge, um, as well as dealing with the different errors that this movement has had. Now the error here then is the error of Parminder, which is, is other things, not just one thing. But in this case, this reform line up here is showing the time setting error, right? Because we have to recognize we can't set time. Now he believed that that was a darkness, no time prophecies after 1844. But we have to agree with Ellen White, don't we? That this message does not hang on time? Yes. But yet God has allowed time in this message at a certain point so that we could repeat the first and second angels' messages. So we could have this experience. So... We, we already sort of recognize November 9th as a parallel to the first day of the first month. So we might even argue that this is about um, maybe April 19th as well. But we know that November 9th lines up, we would say, the first disappointment. And July 18th lines up with the great disappointment, right? But there's a, be an application. But there's a difference between Parminder's time setting and the time setting that that uh, drew the date July 18, 2020. There's a completely different basis. So we're not using dispensationalism. We're understanding the line is typical, that it's not actual. And we're accepting the spirit of prophecy's counsels against time setting but just recognize that God was giving us this time as an illustration of something, which is why when I looked at all of these lines, I realized that it must be a failed prediction, though I couldn't understand how that could be, because I thought, well, even if it's not what we think it is, uh, you know, it is possible that Nashville could be hit by a nuclear attack on July 18, 2020. Now, it wasn't, but we already had the explanation of why it didn't occur in the understanding of the lines. And of course, after July 18th, then we could see this clearly. 
the the sad reality is that most people in this movement still don't understand these lines I don't know how many people could even reproduce what I just drew on the whiteboard if I asked them to. That is, if I gave them some clues about Parminder having a reform line, how would we construct it? They might not even know these way marks. I mean, how many people know February 27th, 2016 is when Parminder is ordained? And we might have some sketchy idea about the two 9-11 prayers, but not many people even really understand October 3rd and October 13th. So this line is something which we, this movement has experienced, but not everybody knows about it. And definitely how to interpret what's happened with our movement, what July 18th really means. I mean, there's just there's just so much that we haven't taken the time to understand. So I, I just don't think you could you could deny this line. How you might interpret it differently, you might say, say it means something different. But as far as structuring a line, to me, it's a flawless line. It is exactly what we would expect to find if we were going to compare this line with our bigger line. So I think it's pretty interesting from my perspective that, you know, something I didn't understand um, until about, uh, so it would have been about 5.30, so, you know, three and a half hours ago. Never even thought of drawing this line like this. And, and until I drew it out, I never really understood it. I just knew that it existed. So any, any final thoughts? Beside a lot more to think about today? No. Okay. Yeah, and, and we have tons of things to think about. As you know, you know, we're still addressing um, these numbers of the numbering of the tribes of Israel in numbers one and two and 26. You know, I've created that chart, which uh, I sent out to people with the sort of, uh, I don't know if I sent it out to everyone. Did everyone get the Excel file with the, with the charts of the comparison of, of all these different um, numberings of the tribes? I don't recall it. Okay, anyway, I, I, I know I put it on WhatsApp, but I don't know. I'll, I'll email this out, because I, I, I did an email, but I don't think I included it in my last email when I uh, sent out the email with um, the PDF from M. L. Andreessen uh, on the um, questions on doctrine, and I also sent out um, the link uh, to uh, what was it that I linked to? Children, spiritual uh, formation. Yeah, yeah, spiritual formation of children from Ministry Magazine in 2020. So yeah, we have all of these um, all these things to think about. It's a lot of stuff. And, and I also have to get ready for the study tomorrow night um, and then the study on Sabbath uh, to continue looking at uh, the Great Reset. So lots of lots of things that I have to study. And, and I know everybody has to spend their own time doing this as well. So, okay. Well, let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the time that we had here this morning. We ask for a blessing upon our day, upon our thoughts, our personal study, and for the study tomorrow night and this Sabbath, the studies on Sabbath. We know, Lord, that um, we rejoice in this light. 
sometimes it's difficult to take the time to really understand it. So we just pray that you can help us enlighten our minds, uh, work with us in our efforts to, to study. And we pray, Lord, that you can help us in our personal struggles in our lives. We know that you love us and care for us. And there's many discouragements in this world. So we just ask, Lord, that we can look above the cares of this world, lift our eyes up, and that we can have this hope set before us, that Christ can return and bring an end to all things. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.